This week, one of Parliament's oldest members, the IFP's Mongosu Tubuteleze, celebrated his 90th birthday and birthday wishes streamed in. With that came accolades for his contribution to the liberation struggle. The question is, is the prince worth celebrating? The Politburo is now in session. Welcome to you. I'm Aldrin St. Pierre. In studio to discuss the legacy of Prince Butelezi, I'm joined in studio by the City Press's Editor-in-Chief, Mondi Makanya. And from our Durban studio, we have political analyst, Polani Dube. Let's start off this discussion by listening to Mongosutu Butelezi um, answering questions after campaigning ahead of the 1999 elections in the then East Rand, where many people died in clashes between the IFP and the ANC. Let's take a listen. Those who have, who have arms, you've got, you've got to reveal them. They've got to, they've got to actually point them out to, to the public protector, as Mr. Philip Powell did. I think it was a good thing that he did so. There are many of them, for instance, who, who had a blanket amnesty, who did not disclose what they did to whom and why they wanted amnesty. And there are many arms that came through Kualela. We know the people that were involved. Some of them are high-ranking people in our society today. Those arms were never shown. And Sifiso Kabinde, before he died, in front of a witness, told me that you know he, he had, there were many, many places where ANC you know, arms are buried and that they were sh shown to him as he, as he claimed by Mr. Chris Harney. And he said, in fact, that caused friction between him and Mr. Zuma because he hadn't shown Mr. Zuma where those arms are just before he died. And just before he died, he said he was going to reveal that. City Press Editor-in-Chief Modli Makanya, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. Let's first start with what he says in that bite, where he speaks about people who have applied uh, for amnesty who did not disclose what they did. Do you think that the prince himself should also disclose his role in the deaths of thousands of South Africans? Yes, I think definitely. You know, uh, there's a big problem, I think, in this country in that we try to rewrite history. Um, and in the case, I mean, like we remember back then, um, P.W. Porter, for instance, when P.W. died, we, people said he kick-started the negotiations, and when Matanzima died, there was a whole lot of, but Matanzima was a good guy. When Mangope died recently, people were saying that Mangope actually contributed to, to the creation of a new South Africa. And there's a lot, there's a lot of rewriting of <laughs> Prince Boutelez's history. And I think that, I mean, like his role in the violence of our past is very central. And he did not definitely come clean during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. To this day, he has been denying how the IFP was a central pillar of the apartheid repressive machinery. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of the violence that we saw in the 80s and 90s in KZN and, 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 and Gauteng was centrally because the IFP was being used by the apartheid well, government, government to suppress um, uh, uprisings and the liberation movement. Let, let me bring in Kolani from our Derby <coughs> studio into this discussion. Kolani, thank you so much for joining us as well. Um, do you think that the Prince has a case to answer to? I, I think uh, the Prince uh, Mangosutu Telezi is an embodiment of the nature of the so-called the African elite. Uh, the pact that they uh, agreed upon with so-called the apartheid political elite as well as uh, the African, I mean, as well as the South African uh, uh, ruling elite. And uh, I think such pact um, made a very kind of compromises to, to the reality that the commoners uh, faced uh, during apartheid. And so I think uh, Mangosu Tuptelez and others are typical default of what comes uh, of the so-called compromised uh, negotiations that South Africa uh, adopted uh, in 1994. 
Well, con considering that, then, do you think that, for instance, we're going to bring up a tweet um, that Mbuse Nindlozi from the EFF um, uh, posted, and in that tweet he then also speaks about that um, Prince Butelezi should be um, awarded, <coughs> he should have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and looking at some of the reaction to that as well, which was quite interesting, people speaking about that if Mbuse Nindlozi speaks about um, Mangosutu Butelezi, you can't use Mangosutu Butelezi's name and peace in the same sentence, uh, they speak about the issues of what happened in Buipatong, for instance. And we know that the TRC Commission has had evidence to that effect, that the leadership of the IFP was actually involved um, in instigating um, the violence in Buipatong. Do you then think that the prince at least should apologize to the people uh, 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 the victims of uh, massacres such as Buipatong, whether it is Katlohong that we speak about as well? I think, uh, as I've said, uh, him not uh, going out publicly, uh, apologizing mm. to the people of South Africa, it shows the, the dictatorship and the arrogancy of the African elite uh, to, to the commoners. Take an example, because he's not the only African elite uh, that has perpetrated such kind of cruelty to, to the commoners of this country. Look at the life as it demand. A number of people have died there. But look at the African elite, how they become so arrogant. Look at the issue of Marrakan uh, massacre. And the African elites, even there, they are so arrogant. They are not even willing to, to meet and, and really apologize to the victims. And so I think Mangosutu, uh, what he did uh, during the times of apartheid, is still a continuation of the arrogancy and inhuman nature of our African mm. elites. Actually, Mondi, in one of the interviews that um, the prince had with the SABC, he said that what the IFP was doing at the time was mere retaliation. They were being provoked, so the IFP was defending itself as well. No, that is absolutely not the case, and history will tell you that what the IFP did, I mean, like that, was that there were death squads that were trained by the apartheid government. We know of the training bases in Mkuse, where IFP death squads were trained. We know about how the, I, the apartheid government took people to Caprivi, um, who were trained by the apartheid well, actually, government. Well, actually, in that interview, he speaks mm. about it. He says that um, at the time, there was an assassination plot against him, and he needed, he needed uh, protection. And um, the government at the time said, listen, come, let's train about 200 of your officers. And um, that had nothing to do with being a death squad. Well, those people that were trained by the apartheid government in Caprivi then went on to be central parts of carrying out massacres. And they came home, actually, and they, they led death squads that took part in massacres in, uh, in parts of KZN and also in parts of Gauteng here on the East Rand and in, in Soweto and so on. That is not protecting somebody from an assassination. They were actively um, assault squads, is, is mm -hmm. essentially. And you know, and it's not just the assault squads. I mean, like that were trained by the apartheid government. The biggest damage was actually done by the Amabuto that were run by as, as regiments by the warlords that uh, Butelezi's um, organization organized. People, for instance, like David Dombela, who was one of the most notorious mm -hmm. warlords of, of that particular period. Here in Gauteng, we had people like uh, Humphrey Koza and, uh, sorry, Humphrey Nlovu and, 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 and Temba Koza, who carried out horrendous massacres and basically ran uh, uh, armies out of, uh, out of the hostels. And that was under the watch of Butelezi. It was not a defensive thing. There were many communities, innocent communities. You had weddings being attacked. You had funerals mm -hmm. being attacked by IFP members. And that is not a defensive thing. And him trying today to again whitewash his image by telling us that the IFP was merely protecting itself is, true, is a blatant lie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, he also in the clip that we played earlier on, the Prince speaks about um, Philip Powell and we know the role that Philip Powell played and um, he had once um, uh, um, spoken about receiving these arms from um, the Kok at the <coughs> time. Do you think that the South African government at least now should actually 
um, extradite something, so someone like Philip Powell and say that come back to South Africa and come and answer um, to some of these allegations as well as the, as the arm caches that were found in, in, in Guazulu Natal. And there should be a holistic investigation into the violence that was, into the violence that was, um, that was led by um, the IFP and, for instance, the liberation, uh, liberation movements like um, the PAC and the ANC for that matter. Look, I, I, I think the question that you have to ask ourselves, is there a villain or a hero in a situation of war? Because I think one who's a villain and one who's a hero is kind of, a, is, is, is relative and is very subjective. And so coming to your question on the issue of uh, uh, summoning and, and so forth, I think uh, South Africa through the TRC, they went through all those things. <coughs> And as I said, the TRC and some of those negotiations were, was a pact of the African elite, the apartheid elite, as well as the business elite or the ruling elite of our country, just to close ranks amongst themselves and to preserve their dominance and power in our country. And so I don't think that such thing uh, can happen unless if the so-called the commoners or the ordinary people can really push for reopening and be active uh, to say, look, the past, there was default that we agreed upon, but we felt that it was necessary then, but now we need to confront the truth. And if we go to that road, trust me, will be opening a can of worm, and I don't think that it will be Telezi, uh, Telezi alone who can uh, mm -hmm. be seen as a villain. I think also others can be dragged along. I wonder then, Mondi, if this is not something worth looking into, <coughs> even if it is a can of worm that is being opened. But of course, we've come to the mm -hmm. end of this discussion. <coughs> Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Colin uh, Dube, thank you so much for your time. And uh, Mondi Makanye will still be joining us after um, the break. And after the break, we'll have a discussion around um, the IEC. Um, the Constitutional Court has been asked again by the IEC to suspend the unconstitutionality of the voters' roll until after next year's elections. What are the implications for this highly contested election that will be taking place in 2019?